Welcome to the Hero Show. It's the Hero Show, John, starring the invincible John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein. You are indubitably John Hersey. And how are you doing today, John? I'm excellent. How are you doing today? I am rock and rolling, man. We are. We got a real. We got a real giant, you know, to discuss today, and somebody whose uh, work is particularly timely in the midst of pandemic, don't we? Absolutely. The illustrious French chemist, microbiologist, pioneer of stereochemistry, pasteurization, Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur, who's uh, dates 1822 to 1895, uh, and one of, the, one of the great research scientists of, of our history, there's so many accomplishments, a few blemishes that we could discuss if we, you know, if we want, because I'm, I just happen to have a copy here of Heroes, Legends, Champions. And as you know, John, I have a chapter on morally flawed heroes. You know, uh, so, you know, Pasteur evidently had a few blemishes, but he's a giant. And God knows how many lives his work, you know, his work on the germ theory of disease has saved. There's probably an incalculable number of human lives that his Count, work has saved. Countless millions of lives. He, he saved countless millions uh, through his, his various, you know, it's rare for a scientist to make one life-changing discovery, one life-serving discovery in their entire careers. Pasteur just made, he just made one after another, after another. Uh, absolutely incredible career. Uh, so, you know, it didn't didn't look like he was going to have that incredible career beginning out. You know, he was a pretty lackluster student. His parents actually moved to Arbois in France to uh, to to get him into a better school. But he wasn't really interested in in school as much as he was in drawing and art and fishing. And uh, so, you know, it, it didn't things didn't look like he was going to be the wor world's greatest scientist of the age. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, you, you, you know, people when they're young, what people do when they're young is not necessarily an indication of what they're going to do for the rest of their lives. I, I mean, when, when I was his age in college, I was, I was not a particularly good student. I was more interested in uh, members of the opposite, uh, I, I should say members of the compatible gender and playing basketball and, you know, things like that. Uh, so... But I ended up, you know, getting a PhD and writing a bunch of books. So you, you, you know, you, you, you never can tell from that. But yeah, you're right. Pasteur's beginnings were not auspicious. I suppose we should um, uh, start out today by giving a hat tip to Paul Saunders, right, who's a science advisor to the Bernstein Institute, because you know, Paul, <laughs> Paul's the one. Paul's the one who recommended that we that we do Pasteur today. I mean, he was on our list. He, he's a giant. We're going to do him anyway, but to do him today. So, you know, so thank you, Paul, for uh, urging us to, to do Pasteur. Yeah, it's particularly timely in the midst of a pandemic, uh, you know, with, the, with, the, with the, the necessity for a vaccine and Pasteur's work on in, in vaccinology, uh, maybe, maybe most famous in, uh, you know, in, in, in treating rabies. I mean, Rabies yeah, I was, think was the highlight of his that. career, yeah. but yeah, he right? grew I mean, up in a village Rabies where apparently there was a, a rabid wolf in his village for a while, and it apparently took out something on the order of eight people. Uh, there was no no cure, no vaccine for rabies. What you did if you got bit was you ran as fast as you could to the local blacksmith and had them cauterize the wound. And of course, people having this hot iron applied to their skin would scream and and pasteur grew up just just basically around the corner he, you know so he could hear these people screaming bloody murder when they're being cauterized and half the time or yeah, most of the time bloody it didn't make any difference i was being, yeah i screamed <laughs> bloody murder too john if i was being cauterized but yeah rabies was untreatable it was a horrible death and uh so yeah plus pasteur at a number of levels i got i, I got a great quote here uh, from Pasteur that I think is indicative of his, his mindset. He said, in the quote, in the field of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind, unquote. Let me, let me repeat that. In the field of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. You gotta, lo gotta love 
got to got to love that. That's yeah, that's that's absolutely true without a doubt. Yeah, his his parents, like I said, they encouraged him to get an education and he wasn't all that interested. But at some point he realized that he was sort of bankrupting the family by going to school and not really con contributing. And so, you know, he decided to get prepared. He decided to pre prepare his mind and, and take it seriously. Uh, got several degrees one after another and uh, ended up at the uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure and became sort of the, the he, he became the teacher's assistant to uh, one of the his greatest forebears, um, Jean Baptiste André Dumas, and uh, You're good with that the really French, opened John. doors for him. You're good it took with a the couple French, years buddy. in high you... school. Yeah. Ah, I, I can fake. I, 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 I'm I guessing you even graduated from high school, didn't you? You know, <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. Good, good <laughs> job. Good job by you. No, I did well. Yeah, yeah you're right. Now, yeah. Pasteur made advances in a number of fields, including one in his uh, his his original field of studies in chemistry. He, he made what, what was it? What was it? advances? Uh, he resolved the problem about the nature of tartaric acid. Now I'm not sure exactly what that mm -hmm. means, but it sounds it sounds <laughs> impressive, and I and I know yeah. no, I know that scientists scientists today re regard that as an advance in the field of chemistry. Well, we're no scientists, but uh, I can speak to this a little bit, and then we'll get out of our, our, our depth pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, he was the first to see, okay, there are these two compounds that appear identical in all their chemical properties. They have similar uh, reactions. They, they seem to be similar, but when you put them under a microscope and look at the crystals that make them up, the crystal structure of these two acids, they were tartar tartaric acid and racemic acid, was slightly different in that both of them were made up of uh, asymmetric crystals. But the racemic acid had asymmetric crystals of two polarities, two sides, so that one was the mirror image of the other. And the, the way that they actually figured this out was they'd beam some light through the compound and the racemic acid would not cause any sort of bending to the light, but when put through the tartaric acid, it would. it would. It would bend the light one way or the other. And that was because it was only uh, a one-sided, there was only the one-sided asymmetric crystals so that didn't have the two to cancel out the effect that you would see uh, in tartaric acid. So that's Roger, my uh, layman's impressed. understanding of, of this discovery. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed. Sounds like you took chemistry in high school also, you know, so... <laughs> So good. I took good one for college you. chemistry class. Good man. They didn't have chemistry yeah, in high school. Okay, but you know, you know a lot more about chemistry than I do. That's that's for sure. Although I know something about romantic chemistry. You know, I you know, I, and I, I I like that topic. But you know, we could we could discuss that on a you know on a on a on another show. But uh, yeah, different. What show. about posh, pa yeah, yeah, different, a different show. Maybe we can get our good friend Ellen Kenner on as a guest uh, and discuss some of the you know, great advances that, yeah, that people have made in that in that <laughs> vital field of you know of, of understanding romantic love. Because I mean, but, but anyhow, I digress. What about what about pasteurization? Because that is uh, that's one of uh, Louis Pasteur's major major advances, right? Yeah, so the way he gets no. there is pretty interesting. Um, you know, he he gets a job teaching chemistry at the University of Strasbourg, where he meets uh, Marie Levant, who they, they fell in love extremely fast. I think that he proposed in a matter of there weeks. There it is. She was there it uh, is romantic chemistry. The, romantic. There it is in the, the romantic the great chemistry. chemistry. You gotta love. You gotta love. You gotta Between love. two chemistry geeks, apparently she was pretty well versed in chemistry. Uh, I think she may have even pointed some some chemical observations out to him, and he was impressed, fell in love very quickly. She was, uh, I believe, a teaching assistant and also the daughter of the rector of the university. And yeah, you wouldn't so, figure, uh, you wouldn't figure that Pasteur would marry a dope, right? Absolutely not. Right. Yeah, he was he, mental connection. He was all about that, you know, shared values. Yeah, yeah. And apparently, she was gorgeous too, so that that doesn't hurt. That doesn't hurt. But that um, doesn't hurt the chemistry. So uh, while well, so, there, the son, the father of one of his students, 
had a company <laughs> distilling uh, beetroot alcohol. And this stuff just, it, he, you know, he was making it, he was shipping it. By the time it got to people, it tasted terrible. It was sour. Um, so he came to Pasteur asking, hey, can you, can you please help me? And Pasteur was not one of these, you know, Robert Stadler's of the world that is a proponent of, of pure science. Robert Stadler's the, one of the villains from Atlas Shrugged. Highly recommend right, that book. Right, right. Uh, Pasteur said, there's no such thing as a special category of science called applied science. There is science and there are its applications, which are related to one another as the fruit is related to the tree which is born it. So he just nice. dove into this problem, absolutely loved it. Uh, his wife reported that he was up to his neck in beet juice and just spent all his time at the distillery uh, looking for well, microorganisms. I, I, I hope he took a shower before he came home to Mrs. Pasteur. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> she well, might not like that. Yeah. I remember as a, I mean, as a kid growing up, I'd always see on the milk container, you know, the milk, the milk's been pasteurized uh, and homogenized. But, the, the, you know, but pasteurization, of course, uh, Pasteur obviously developed the process by which you, you heat the beverage, right, to kill off, to kill off the offending back, or offensive bacteria that might cause diseases and even, and even death and uh, made it much safer to drink milk, wine, beer, you know, and d different beverages like that. Yeah, it was applied first to this uh, beetroot alcohol. And actually, Pasteur never applied it to milk. That wasn't done, I think, until like the late, like the 1888, maybe, by another chemist who was inspired by Pasteur. But yeah, Pasteur, uh, he, he, you know, he started studying the, the alcohol and found microorganisms in it. And this was really the beginning of, of germ theory. I mean, he wasn't uh, the literal founder of germ theory, but his work did an amount, immense amount to support germ theory and to bring it into its next phase of development. Right, right. I think we have, in fairness, in objectivity and justice, we need to say Pasteur is one of the, you know, one of the founders uh, of germ theory and one, one of the great scientists who most advanced our understanding of it. And it was his work in the in fermentation and 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 then developing the, of the pasteurization process that led him to realize that that germs that infect various you know animals and human beings cause all kinds of diseases, right? And and that that of course uh, major major breakthrough in our in our in our understanding of the you know in the, in the field of medicine. Yeah, most scientists, most doctors didn't really think, oh, they they didn't think that there was these tiny microscopic organisms that could take out a human being or could take out a horse or a cow or a sheep. They just didn't believe that there were these microorganisms and Pasteur's work showed that there was. Uh, he found this lactic bacilli, he called it, in the beetroot juice, which instead of like the yeast consuming sugar and creating alcohol, it consumed it and created these other byproducts that were just malodorous and, and disgusting. So his, his uh, paper on this is sometimes called the birth certificate of microbiology because it showed for certain that there were these microorganisms. And this caused uh, English physician Joseph Lister, a surgeon, to take that principle and start applying it to surgical methods. He thought, well, there are these microorganisms that can cause these problems in alcohol. Perhaps there are microorganisms in our surgical equipment Perhaps we should start boiling this stuff. So he quickly came up with uh, some, some antiseptic techniques, wound dressings, hand washing with uh, diluted carbolic acid, and uh, really pioneered the antiseptic method. His name, Joseph Lister. Listerine is actually derived from that. I was amused when that's I found right. that connection. Yeah, that's right. Lister, Lister of course, the... Uh, uh, British surgeon, like like you said, Sean, reading reading one of Pasteur's papers, you know, uh, realized that if we kept uh, this, if we kept the surgical theater antiseptic, that we might uh, lower the risk. So, so many people, you know, so many people you know, recovered from the surgery, but acquired some secondary infection, you know, and then died from it. That's that's why uh, going back historically. 
the male life expectancy was was traditionally higher than the female life expectancy because so many otherwise healthy teenage girls or young women would give birth, survive childbirth, but you know the hands of the midwife or the doctor were filthy, or you know they were very poor. They lived in some hovel and it was filthy, and she derived some secondary infection and died at age seventeen. You know, or you know, or some or something like that. So when Lister you know, the light bulb goes off when he's reading, you know, Pasteur's paper on, on the efficacy of uh, the power of germs. And he, he starts, you know, an, uh, using antiseptic measures in the, uh, you know, in, in the operating theater. The, the surgeons re recognized Lister's rate of survival was much higher than other surgeons. And he wasn't a better surgeon than these other guys. He was just, you know, uh, he was just applying Pasteur's theory of germs uh you know and keeping the, the keeping the operating room clean listen to this i have this i have this uh quote here uh inspired by louis pasteur's ideas on microbial infection the english doctor joseph lister demonstrated in 1865 that use of carbolic acid on surgical dressings would significantly reduce rates of post-surgical infection lister's work like you said john in turn inspired St. Louis-based Dr. Joseph Lawrence to develop an alcohol-based formula for surgical antiseptic, and Lawrence named his antiseptic Listerine in honor of Joseph <laughs> Lister. And by the way, I if that. I can, yeah, I could pat myself on the back. There's a little section in the Capitals Manifesto on this, so, you know. Uh, if, any, if anybody, <laughs> if anybody wants to wants to check that out, but. Um, yeah, these guys are these guys are giants, you know. I mean, so so much of what we take for granted, not just Listerine, but just safe surgical procedures uh, come from Pasteur and Lister. There's a great dramatization of Lister and his. He he just so often gave credit to Pasteur for really highlighting the the principle here that allowed him to go on and, and pioneer and become the father of antisepsis. And uh, there, there's. A great dramatization in a movie called The Life, or sorry, The Story of Pasteur, The Story of Louis Pasteur. I think it's from like 1939, black and white film. Uh, there's oh, like no music in the film, one? which is. John, is that yeah. the one with Paul Muni? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he won the Academy kid. Award for that role. Did he? And it's brilliant. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I think there might be a few things that are uh, historically inaccurate, but in general, it sticks to the history and does a really good job. And Lister, you know, throughout is just congratulating uh, Pasteur. And it, it, I understand it. That is, uh, he, he was extremely uh, thankful and grateful to Pasteur and always gave due credit to Pasteur for uh, really unearthing the principle here. Yeah, and that's that's great to see, you know, that the way the way these giants recognize each other, because so often, yeah, you know, there's this there's this jealousy, and you know, there's this there's this resentment among scientists or theorists in other fields as who first developed this idea. And Pasteur's life itself was not, you know, was not rid of 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 those kinds of of issues. But it's great to see this kind of you know mutual respect, you know. Um, between two great scientists like this, Lister and Pasteur, and then, and giving credit to each other, you know, where credit was due. It's that's great to see. But yeah, our good friend uh, John, our good friend Robert Begley, um, w once said to me that you know the the only place where these great heroes get along is in Ayn Rand's novels. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, sadly, there's some truth to that. You know, I mean, the American founders. Did not in many cases did not particularly get along, you know, uh, very well. There's a number of examples of that, and uh, you know, Leonardo and uh, Michelangelo did, did not get along so well. So there's 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 good ex uh, you know examples of, of of such things. So it's it's great to see you know two men of such stature you know recognize each other and give credit where credits due. Absolutely, yeah. one of these beautiful rare scenes in history, I guess. <clears throat> so, uh, Louis well, then went on. We, said, we, and, we did our show. On, we did our show. We did our show on Aristotle, and of course, Plato and Aristotle were like father and son. And, and although Plato, to, in my judgment, did much more harm than, than he did good, still he's a giant in the field of philosophy, and they, probably not an accident that the greatest philosopher of history was his student, uh, you know, and, and colleague and friend. 
So it does happen. Yeah, it's interesting. We don't know what would have happened if Plato had lived longer and, and their falling out had been more public. Perhaps uh, the story wouldn't be like that because, of course, Aristotle went on to repudiate pretty much all of Plato or many of Plato's ideas, not all of them. But um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting, as you as you point out, when when you have these giants of the intellect, one of the things that characterizes them is that they're certain of their ideas and when they run up against others that are certain of their ideas and their ideas are, are the opposite, then, you know, they're, they're going to butt heads. And of course, as you mentioned, yeah. that happened with Pasteur a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unfo- I guess we should point out, unfortunately, you know, he, uh, here's, here's the bad news. And I think we just spent a couple of minutes on it and then spend the, the overwhelming preponderance of time on his achievements. But uh, the bad news was when he told his family like, don't don't release my laboratory notes, right? And and they were not did not become public. I don't know, like a hundred years after he died, and it showed evidently the uh, there's been some scholarly research on this in the last twenty or thirty years. Evidently, it shows some uh, you know not that that posture in some cases was dishonest that he he, he engaged in the uh, you know these kind of petty professional rivalries. He, uh, that's that there were there were times when he was. He acted in a way that was not worthy of his own genius and his and his own achievements, and so we have to we have to recognize that we you know, you know we acknowledge it's true we uh, deplore it, and like you know in the in the hero book I gotta get another plug for the hero book there it is, uh, but in the hero book I have that chapter on you know morally flawed heroes with Thomas Jefferson as a leading example still, the life giving achievements vastly outweigh the flaws and you know a, a beautiful principle of the objectivist ethics john is it's more important to reward the good than it is to punish the wicked we, we need to fight evil you know we do that we push it aside we focus on the good and posture is a giant there's no question he's right in our mind he's a giant his his his, his work like you said I, uh, millions and millions and millions of human lives have been saved extended by many years in 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 good health so i mean he's yeah we we it's why he's on yeah. this show with us right he is a towering hero in the field of not even a, not even an md or you know he was a chemist right but his his work uh led to such advances in the in the field of medicine it's we really have we really admire him yeah these small yeah, personality these small issues personality as i would call them are certainly call. nothing like feet of clay and um you know, let's dive back into his achievements. So in the 1860s, right. silkworm, silk production had had drastically fallen. Uh, in about 1853, people had started to notice that there was the, the, or these diseases or really they thought this disease that was taking out the silkworm population. And by 1865, production was at, at about one one thousandth of it, what it had been a little more than a decade earlier. So the French government actually tapped Louis Pasteur to step in and see what he could do. And he spent, I think, about five years working on this project. And uh, so he moved his family out to the country. And Marie, you know, as we, we mentioned, she could hold her own in a laboratory. She actually became an expert at breeding silkworms. Well, Pasteur sort of developed the pathology around them. And one of the things he noticed uh, in time was that some of the silkworms when infected, they would die really quickly and others would take several weeks to die. And over time, he, he came to realize that they were actually dealing with two different diseases, one that came to be known as pebrin, the other one that came to be known as flashery. And the first would, uh, it, you know, you, you would see these corpuscles develop on the insects and the insect would in time die. So, um, you know, he developed methods for, for dealing with both of these that are still in use today. They would, they would take the, you know, the, the moth would lay the eggs. They would take the moth, crush it up into just a, a, a powder, essentially, <clears throat> and then test that powder for the pebrin. And if, the, if it was found, if any uh, evidence of, of it was found, they would get rid of those eggs. And they, they would do a similar thing for the... Uh, for the flashery, uh, it was also involved a uh, the, the food source mulberry leaves w- would become contaminated. So they instituted some some measures for keeping that clean, and 
uh, he, he basically solved this crisis that had, had actually extended not only from France, but throughout Europe. Uh, really incredible. Yeah, you may, uh, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, you may. Yeah, absolutely. You made a good point before, John, that, you know, that like we, we, what we discussed, uh, Joseph Priestley, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago and the Lunar Society of Birmingham, these guys and, and Pasteur, these guys are the anti-Robert Stadler, you know, and, and like you pointed out, Stadler is one of the villains. Uh, he was a semi-hero who became a villain. He was a theoretical scientist and he, he had, you know, he had disdain for, you know, technology and applied science. He, he, he regarded, he called it like plumbing, you know, he, he was dismissive in that regard. But, uh, uh, you know, the heroine in the story, Dagny Tagus, talks about, you know, they, 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 I don't want to give away, I don't want to give away the mystery, but there's a character who, right, who creates this brilliant advance in motors in, 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 in Atlas Shrugged, and Stadler's looking at it. He said, well, well you, could you, do you realize, he says to Dagny Tagus, the story's heroine, the problems in theoretical physics he had to solve, you know, to do this? Why would he spend his time, you know, building this piece of, you know, this, this piece of machinery, you know, this 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 this, this, this mechanical device, and Dagny says, "Well, perhaps he wanted to live on Earth, you know, Doctor Stad." <laughs> you know, and there's <laughs> there, there's Pasteur, there's Priestley, there's these great scientists who realize Benjamin Franklin was another one, you know, great scientist. He wasn't satisfied until he had some application, like the lightning rod, for his advances in the field of electricity and you know, and the relationship to, to lightning. That the idea of science in any other field of cognition is to is to promote human life, and you know Pasteur certainly did that. The silkworm industry benefited enormously from his from his work in that field, as as I understand. Yeah, and and throughout, you know, whenever he'd publish papers and and give talks, he would credit the people in the industry for helping him. You know, back when he was working on. Uh, the, the problem with the tartrates, he would credit, uh, I think it was Kestner was the producer where he was able to, uh, to find and isolate the tartrate. So he would credit these people in industry and he, he absolutely did not shy away from working with them. He, he actively looked for integrations that would allow people to use the science that he was creating. You know, he, like we said earlier, he grew up in a village with a, a rabid wolf and he was surrounded by death. They, he and his wife would lose several children to typhoid and other diseases. And uh, so he was interested not just in, in you know, pure science, as he said, there's no such thing. There's, there's science and there's the fruit of science. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, a nice way to, you know, it's a, it's a really nice way to put it. And, you know, um, what, just a couple of other points I want to make about, about Pasteur and Joseph Lister. Uh, by the way, Lister also, married a scientist. His wife also you know, was very actively involved in the, in the research that, that he did. So, you know, it makes sense, right? These, um, these two giants in the, you know, in, in the field of science, they, they didn't marry just some, you know, just some, somebody who, who may have been a, you know, nice girl, which is a, you know, what is somebody, marry somebody who was, you know, very, not only very smart, but very her values were very focused on the same field and they shared you know they shared this kind of research and 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 work together which is great you know unfortunately in the 19th century there weren't nearly as many opportunities for women you know in the in the field of science as as there as there are today and hopefully you know hopefully there's there'll be a number of young girls growing up who inspired by this you know, who, 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 they, who themselves you know love the field of science and realize hey you know, I could, you know, I could do this too. I could be a chemist or a biologist or a physicist or, you know, or, or whatever. Um, the other, the other thing I wanted to mention was about Lister's use of carbolic acid, you know, as a, as an antiseptic. Ayn Rand fans will remember, you know, the line, quote, Petrograd, Petrograd smelt of carbolic acid, unquote, which is the, uh, the first line of Ayn Rand's novel, We the Living. You know, as Kira Agunova makes her, uh, her return to St. Petersburg, which had been renamed Petrograd during the Russian Revolution, first thing she, first thing she notices on the train was the smell of carbolic acid. So, early 20th century, of course, Russia was a backwards place. I, I think in the West they had moved on to 
better better methods of antiseptic than carbolic acid. But evidently, carbolic acid was a little, it, it worked anyway. And and the the Soviets were using it in 1918, 1919, 1920, whatever you know, whatever whatever year that was. So carbolic acid, yeah. Evidently, evidently, you know, it, it was a, a, an effective antiseptic and helped, you know, it helped keep uh, germs from infecting people, animals, and causing all kinds of diseases. Yeah, it's interesting how much of Pasteur's work, today we have this very great divide, you, you'd think, between uh, medical doctors, people that treat humans, and veterinarians. Of course, they both study the same subject, medicine. But there's not the this you know or uh, organic integration that happened in Pasteur's day, and much of his work leading up to working on diseases that affected humans were working with animals, including his next ones. We went from silkworms next to the chicken co cholera epidemic in the 1870s, and he was able to isolate the microorganism causing the cholera. Um, they infected some chickens so that they could document the progression of the disease. And he's working, he partnered with Charles Cumberland. And Cumberland, uh, you know, great chemist and, and uh, thinker in his own right, <laughs> accidentally, apparently, he, Pasteur was too much of a taskmaster. He gave him too much to do. Cumberland left some of the, uh, they, they actually were able to synthesize the germ in the lab and use that to infect the chickens they were studying. He left some of that out of the incubator. And I, I think for several weeks, maybe a month before injecting the chickens with it. Well, Pasteur said, you know, do it anyway. Uh, we don't want to waste this stuff. So he injects chickens with this, uh, you know, the, the isolated germ causing cholera and they don't get sick. So Pasteur says, well, you know, just give them the full, the full, fully virulent strain of, of the cholera germ and, you know, do what I told you to do, you know, document this, the, the progression of this disease. Well, something crazy happened through this accident. They discovered that by having first given this less virulent version of the cholera, vac uh, cholera germ, to these chickens, they'd inoculated them from the full virulent, the, the fully virulent version of the, of the cholera germ. So they created a vaccine by accident. They created one of the first vaccines. Uh, there was, of course, uh, vac vaccination before this time. People vaccinated for smallpox going way back, all the way back, I think, to China. Uh, of course, George Washington uh, had all the soldiers in the Continental Army vaccinated against smallpox which turned out to be a huge, huge benefit to the Continental Army. And Edward Jenner had, had come up with a cowpox, uh, sorry, smallpox vaccine by uh, basically figuring out that, that cowpox was a less virulent version of it and using that as a vaccine. So when, right. <clears throat> when Pasteur, right. go ahead. No, I'm not going to mention Jenner. I'm glad, I'm glad you... You you brought that up. People, I mean, people today don't realize what a major killer smallpox was. You know, I mean, smallpox was just uh, you know killed I don't know how many people uh, historically. And for the American Indian tribes, you know, who had no you know they they had no resistance to it. You know, there's no there's no good locution for it. I think we mentioned this before, right? American Indians, they're not from India, but Native Americans implies they're indigenous to the North American continent, which is false and politically correct. Uh, so, the, you know, these tribes from Central Asia um, had no, they, you know, they had no immunity to smallpox. And, the, you know, European settlers came over and smallpox killed God knows how many, you know, um, members, of, for want of a better term, American Indians, uh, and, and people throughout Europe historically. I mean, it was a major killer. And so, yeah, you're right, Edward Jenner, that's, that's, they were back in the 18th century enlightenment, right? It was the 1780s, 1790s, when Jenner realized that the, the cowpox, yeah, so, so kind of, I guess it's a related, a weaker disease. If, if you have cowpox, you could, or, or inoculate with cowpox, you could develop some kind of immunity to smallpox. So vaccinology certainly goes back a long ways, like, like, you, like you said, and Pasteur and his, uh, and his team uh, took the next step, right? They, they, they took the science of vaccinology further. 
Yeah, Jenner had come up with this, you know, cowpox for smallpox vaccine. Uh, cowpox, by the way, in French was vaccine. And so when when Pasteur oh, was right? uh, that's yeah. So Pasteur actually uh, he he actually coined the term vaccine as a, as a broader term for for you know what we now know today are, as vaccines. He when he was discussing his findings with the Academy of Science in France said, I have given to the term vaccination an extension which science, I hope, will adopt as an homage to the merits and the immense services rendered by Jenner. So he, he, again, you know, he was uh, always recognizing the people that uh, provided the, the seeds that allowed him to then develop their, their thinking and others repaid that. Yeah, Jenner, another giant of science, great to see Pasteur you know, from a previous century. Great to see Pasteur recognizing that and giving uh, you know, and giving him credit. And uh, they say, John, they say that Pasteur is fearless. Can we, can we move on to rabies or back or, or back to rabies? Uh, well, okay, we should talk about anthrax scene. real quick first. Um, okay, yeah, go so ahead. Go I ahead. Think anthrax, we'll talk about Pasteur just chronologically. Just, just a minute, right. Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, so uh, anthrax was, uh, you know, rampant throughout, throughout France and it spread into other parts of Europe. Uh, the fields where a cow died of anthrax, they wouldn't be able to use that ground because other, uh, other animals that were eating from the, the same ground would invariably get, uh, they would invariably get anthrax as well. They were called, they called these fields, les champs maudits, the cursed fields. And Pasteur again teamed up with a couple other scientists, Charles Chamberlain again, and another guy, Emile Rowe. And together they came up with two methods of weakening anthrax. So that, you know, th this idea, by the way, that a, a virulence of being able to uh, take a, a germ and make it less virulent was really, in, in large part, this, this came from Pasteur's work. Uh, so they... Uh, Emile Roux uh, came up with the, the primary method, I think, that was used. But they were able to isolate the anthrax germ to start testing it to, again, create a, a vaccine. And uh, Pasteur's friend, a veterinarian named Rossignol, organized a public experiment in 1881. So between May 5th and May 31st, Pasteur injected his vaccinations, there were three rounds of vaccinations, into 25 sheep and they had a control group of another 25. And on May 31st, they injected the entire 50 sheep with the uh, with with anthrax. And you know the, the naysayers said, "Well, all 50 are are going to die. This, this is ridiculous. There are no such things as germs. There aren't these microorganisms that can that can kill these animals." And uh, of course, what happened? Pasteur was proved right. The 25 who did not receive the vaccine died, and all of those who were vaccinated lived. So immediately his, his fame grew. Uh, they were able to reduce the deaths by anthrax from about 10% of the population of sheep down to about 1%. So uh, in addition to that, he also taught them bury the dead sheep, the, de the sheep who die of anthrax, or the animals that die of anthrax, bury them in sandy soil because what's happening is the earthworms, when, when you bury the sheep in a, a more clay soil, the earthworms are taking that anthrax germ and they're carrying it up to the surface. And that's why uh, it's being transferred to other animals. So he was able to uh, tamp down on this, this spread of anthrax by creating the first vaccine for anthrax ever. And, and then yeah, next, and again, uh, from there, from there he went on to yeah. rabies. Right, right, and and again we see several several points here. Again, we see you know the application, the 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 fascination with promoting human life on Earth. In this case, you know, saving the lives of, of the livestock, you know, and enabling human beings to have mutton, right? Have 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 lamb, uh, and of course, you know, wool, you know, for for clothing and, and everything. So again, again. You know the the, the 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 realization that that science and cognition more broadly is about uh, it's it's not knowledge just for its own sake. It's knowledge to advance human life and make make human life better on Earth. 
like Dagny Taggart said, to Robert Stadler and Atlas Shrugged. Also, you know, one other point before we move to rabies, John, and that is, it's understandable why scientists in the day, even if they, you know, even if they were well aware of the existence of microorganisms, why they doubted their efficacy or their virulence, you know, in, in, in disease, because, I mean, they're so tiny, you know, I mean, they're, they're so tiny, they can only be seen through a microscope. But who would, who would suspect, you know, that you're a powerful, you know, rugged man, you know, you're six feet tall and you weigh you're 190 pounds, and you're very athletic and you're strong and fast and everything. Who, uh, who would suspect that these tiny little things that you can't even see would have the power to, to kill, to, to make ill or, or kill this, this powerful man, much less, you know, a gorilla or an elephant or some even more powerful, physically powerful uh, animal. So you can understand the skepticism, you know, but, um, and, and skepticism is part of science. And that's, this is why, this is why you need to, you know, form experiments and then, and then uh, let other scientists know exactly what you did so they could seek to replicate the experiments. You, you know, uh, do you hear me, uh, Michael Mann, you know, from uh, the, the so-called climate scientist who wouldn't, uh, you know, remember Michael Mann, John, who would, the, the hockey stick graph who wouldn't reveal, you know, it wouldn't reveal his data and his methods. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, it's been known for a long time that, you know, we need to be able to, you know, we need to reveal our data so we can replicate experiments. And you can see why. Anyway, skept healthy skepticism is part of science. You can see why scientists doubted the virulence, the power of germs. And, you know, and the, the bad news, of course, is they didn't, uh, some of these scientists didn't just doubt the power of germs. They doubted Pasteur's sanity. They thought he, you know, they thought he was crazy, and they, you know, they, they condemned him publicly as such. And there's no need for that, right? No need for that. Yeah. Let's, let's replicate the experiments. And that's why he came back and said, let's do this public experiment. You know, he wasn't afraid to show his findings on a, on a public stage because he wanted people to benefit from his discoveries. He wanted people not, you know, it, this wasn't just, oh, I want to make some advance and get this written up in, in some journal somewhere. This was, you know, if people know this at large and if I'm not widely discredited by, you know, other scientists who don't believe in my ideas, then people can really take advantage of the work I've done and live better lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then he went, like you said, he went on to do it again. What did you say at the show's outset? He had the, uh, not just one or two advances, major advances in science, a whole, uh, a host of them. And went on, at this time he was a celebrated figure in, 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 in France, and rightly so. And he went on to find a, a treatment for rabies, which we, you know, we discussed briefly at the outset. We should probably discuss more, more fully now. I mean, the rabies horrible. <laughs> yeah. Here's some disease. Yeah, they, 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 yeah, just... yeah. I was reading about Pasteur last night. There was, there was one of his contemporaries said that Pasteur was fearless. You have a rabid dog, ah, you know, snarling and foaming at the mouth and everything. And while he had two of his assistants wearing big, you know, gauntlets, you know, these heavy, long leather gloves to protect them. And there was a bulldog too, and there, there he's talking about in this particular example. They're powerful animals holding the bulldog down. And Pasteur is in the dog's mouth getting specimens of saliva and stuff. <laughs> That's pretty fearless. Yeah. I wouldn't do it. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't be it's, rooting it's... around in the mouth of a rabid dog to get specimens of its <laughs> saliva. But sometimes science requires your real courage. Uh, courage, but, uh, you, you could call it. Uh, maybe that Maybe that would, would be where he people thought he was on the edge of his sanity. You know, he took a straw and put it on the gums of the dog and, and sucked some of this through the straw, obviously not far enough that they, he'd get it in his own mouth. And while they were doing this, uh, I think the niece of Emile Rue wrote that they always kept a loaded pistol nearby because if any, any accidents were to happen, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't for the animal, although they need to shoot the animal too, but it was for the, the, the guy. You know, if somebody got bit or something, uh, s just a slight amount of the uh, the, the rat, the rabies infected saliva got in a wound or something, one of the others would would you know agree to shoot them. I don't think they ever actually had to resort to this, but this was oh extremely God. dangerous. What they're doing, extremely dangerous. Yeah. 
Well, I didn't know that particular detail. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say if, if, if one possible outcome of the experiment is I got to get shot, yeah, that would be, yeah, I would be, I would consider that a hazardous, you know, hazardous duty. Like, but sometimes well, I mean, science the, is the like, alternative. The, the alternative to getting shot is, is we should talk about how just bad rabies is. And it still obviously exists. Uh, thankfully, Pasteur created the vaccine. We no longer have to worry about this to the extent that people once did. But, you know, it caused rage and drooling. People would be unable to swallow anything. And they'd get to the point where they develop hydrophobia, an actual fear of water. Even though they're dying of thirst, they're actually afraid of water. And they would have, they would lapse into, uh, they'd have moments of clarity where they'd realize that they were crazed and dying. And then they'd, they lap backs into be, basically the slobbering monster. So, you know, you're better off in these yeah, cases horrible. being euthanized. Yeah. Nobody wants it's to horrible. die of rabies. Yeah. My gunshot, my gunshot wound. I mean, that's, that's some form of euthanasia, isn't it? But, um, uh, yeah, but it's better. <laughs> it's those are the two choices. It's certainly better than the long, drawn out, agonizing suffering of a of a rabies uh, victim. Which reminds me, you know, since literature has always been my favorite field. Did you ever read Old Yeller or see the movie version of of, of that no. classic? I'll add that to my list. But, the ever growing list of well, it's a, it's classic a movie education. Well, it's a children's story, but Old Yeller was you know was American dog um, and saves the family from some from some you know rabid animals and it's heartbreaking because then they realize that yellow was bit and 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 mm. you know, go in the pet the dog that that love that you love and the dog who loves you and it starts to snarl and foam and they realize at the end of the story they had to put old yellow down break you know start to cry now even 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 uh, thinking about it so yeah. it's a real tear but it's uh, yeah, it's a real tearjerker, but it's a, also a heartwarming story about a great dog who saved the family and again, points out the horrors of, uh, you know, of rabies. So Pasteur, again, uh, saved a lot of human lives. And uh, so, so let me ask, because I know, I mean, you know, we're animal lovers, uh, and, I, and I know that veterinary medicine is not as advanced as human medicine, which on the one hand is sad because we love animals. But on the other hand, it makes sense because human life is, is sacred, and that's where the you know, our resources should go. So, uh, the, the the vaccines developed for rabies do they do they work on dogs now? I mean, I'm not. I, I know that I know they save human lives. Do they save dogs' lives also? I think if you if you vaccinate soon enough after the the uh, initial bite, they can, and that's what they that's you know this is actually how he tested. This is how Pasteur tested. He tested on animals um so we should give credit also to emile rue his his uh, uh, partner on this came up with the method of of weakening the anthrax germ by desiccating or, or drying the brain and spinal cord of the uh the rabid animals and then it would take the the germ uh once it had been weakened and give it to uh they tested mostly on rabbits in this case and uh, yeah, if they were able to to give the germ soon enough after the uh, after the animal was given rabies, yeah, they could they could reverse course. And you know, the first person we should talk about the first person to be vaccinated for rabies, the young boy Joseph Meister, who came his, came his with his mother in tears. He had been bitten fourteen times by a rabid dog. Uh, just a couple of days before, and they, they brought him uh, to Pasteur to say, you know, we know you're doing this work on rabies. Can you please just do whatever you can for my boy? And Pasteur was not a, a licensed doctor. Um, oh, he could right. have been right. could have been locked up for for doing what he did, but he couldn't just let this boy go through what he was about to go through, and so began a series of of vaccinations, thirteen at all. And saved his life, and this became a phenomenon. And hundreds of people, not only from from Paris, but from all over the world, sort of descended on Pasteur, and he started treating people for for rabies and uh, making his treatments widely available. So this is 
Yeah, you know, I think his greatest achievement, his crowning achievement, is to take everything that he's learned from you know just the uh, the nature of crystals to finding microorganisms in uh, various beverages, figuring out how to cure uh, or to vaccinate against cholera, uh, dealing with silkworms and uh, anthrax, and then you know at the end of his life, rabies. So it's just huge achievement. Huge, huge, right. massive. Right, and no way to calculate how many lives he saved, and and our pets too. We have to think about what we do without them. I, I couldn't possibly live without my dogs. So, uh, thank you, Pastor. No, I, I, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, pa Louis Pasteur is you know uh, you know is right, and it's really you know this may be a good point to to wrap up the hero show for today because you know in the twenty first century. Is living in the in the Western world, in the you know, in the scientifically, technologically, and industrial advanced, you know, capitalist and semi-capitalist countries, we take for granted so many advances that you know that have been made in in our life before our lifetime, and, and we don't even realize what went on, you know, before. But I think it, I think it was Newton who said, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And um, yeah. this is one of the giants that Pasteur shoulders of the, one of the giants that we stand stand on the cure the treatment and cures for all these diseases. I mean, nobody that I know of dies of rabies anymore, suffers from rabies. When I was a kid, the the vaccines for rabies. Thank God I never had having, but the vaccines for rabies were, were it was notoriously painful. It's a whole bunch of shots you took in your stomach and everything. Those are the first steps, you know. Pasteur made the made the first steps to treating this, you know, curing this disease. Today, today, rate no, you know, I think I think the rabies vaccinations are much much less onerous and much less painful uh, than they were even when I was a kid. Much less back in Pasteur's day. But even no matter how painful it was to get the vac, the, you know, to get the shots, it's nothing compared to having the disease and and you know and dying. I mean, how many people did uh, did die of it? So I mean, yeah, you're 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 right. Pasteur's Crowning achievement, uh, the, the treatment for rabies, the capacity to cure rabies, and of course, overall, I think I, I, I think I would say anyway. I'm um, John. See what you think. Uh, that just you know, being the pioneer in the in the germ theory of disease and pointing out the power of germs, the virulence that germs can have, you know, to to kill human beings and, and animals, and you know, uh, leading to all kinds of treatments, you know antibiotics and stuff eventually uh to you know to, to, to kill off the offending microbes without harming the organism inspiring lister to antiseptic conditions i mean this is one of the greatest achievements i think uh in the uh, of the human mind and, you know as life promoting achievements of the human mind in, in all of our history absolutely I mean, so and broad. his legacy so impact broad. was immeasurable yeah. it's so broad uh, yeah absolutely. people did like not people did not expect medicine to advance you know back then i mean they, they not at the rate it does today they didn't expect well maybe in a few years from now somebody will have a cure for this like right now we're trying to turn out some sort of covid vaccine well the idea of even being able to do that in large part comes from pasteur so you know this idea of progress this idea of growth in medicine, uh, we really ought to thank Pasteur for it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and and, and uh, your know, vaccine, uh, you will, I'm, I'm guessing we'll have one for for COVID within within the within the next year. Would would be, would be my I'm just guessing, but would be my guess. And also the capacity to treat it. You know, what was the big controversy that over what hydroxychloroquine or you know or something yeah, or malarial. Yeah, the malarial malarial drug. But we have so many of these medications because uh, originally the realization that germs cause uh, a lot of these diseases, and we need to be able to you know keep the germs out, antiseptic conditions, or kill them kill them once they get in, and uh, you know like antibiotics. And uh, Alexander Fleming wasn't that the name of the English researcher who first discovered penicillin early twentieth century, and then. Yep. I think, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, especially in the United States, right around the time of World War II or afterwards, started to, to mass produce, um, you know, uh, uh, antibiotics. 
and and today we have this you know this plethora of antibiotics to that that will cure or the very very least treat you know uh, diseases that prior to Pasteur in the late 19th century what was just fatal and, and just killed God knows how many people so yeah Pasteur's work is just enormously life-giving he's he's really one of the giants in the in the in the field of science whose whose work just advanced human life enormously hugely inspiring i know uh, i'm inspired and, and it, it really it, you know it makes you think there are you know, these different realms of heroes really and there are those that come up with these great life-changing ideas and those ideas get instituted at a cultural or political level. But then there are the heroes that solve these huge problems, these problems that impinge directly on human life in a more concrete way. And Pasteur is definitely toward the top of that echelon. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He's got to be at the, up at, at the pinnacle of, of, the, of the pantheon of, of heroes. If one of, one of the things that heroes do is they take action in promotion of human life, then Pasteur's uh, work was of incalculable benefit to human life. And we can't, we can't praise him enough. Whatever, whatever minor flaws that may have been character, you know, we recognize those as honest must, we deplore them, uh, but we focus overwhelmingly on the man's extraordinary life-giving achievements. One of the real giants, John. It's been, it's been, it's just an, an honor just to discuss you know, somebody like this, and an inspiration, like you said. So, I think I'm going to wish you, uh, John Hersey, I hope you have a more heroic day. You as well. Have a, have a very heroic day and get some heroic work done. And we'll see you all next week. If you're enjoying the show, please give us a five-star rating and subscribe and tell your friends about it. I'm sure they could use the inspiration too. Absolutely. See you guys next week on The Hero Show. Have a more heroic day, everybody.